Keystone Church, we're glad you're here. Would you stand with us? Let's sing together. Oh 
morning. And so we're glad that you've come to be a part of just lifting up the name of Jesus. And so we're about to jump into the word of God together, but take a second and say hey to some of the people around you, and then we'll dive into God's word. Well, good morning, Keystone Church. How are we? All right. It's good to see you guys here this morning. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Will Mitchell, and I'm on staff here at Keystone. And if it's um, if Keystone is new to you, if maybe you haven't gotten connected yet, uh, I would love to meet you. I'll be out at the welcome space right after service. I'd love to get a chance to meet you and help you take your next step getting connected. Um, the very first step that you can take right now, though, is if you've got your phone, you can pull it out. You can scan the QR code right in front of you or up here on the screen behind me and just drop us a little bit of info and I'll be in touch. I would love to just, like I said, whether it's, um, hey, how do I take my next step with Jesus um, or how do I take my next step in the life of this church? We'd love to help you do that. We have a lot to celebrate this morning, and I just wanted to celebrate two things here with you, and just, uh, I, I feel like we're, I'm really good at always looking forward to what's next, right? Like, I'm a forward-thinking person, and so I'm always like, hey, what's next, what's next? And I don't know if you're like this, but sometimes, like, I just don't even pause to just celebrate what just happened, right? Like, I'm, like, it's like the store, like, you walk in, and it's like the day after Christmas, and like, all the Valentine's candies on the shelf, right? I do that. And so I just want to pause for a moment, and we just want to give God a, a ton of thanks. So um, last weekend was Easter weekend here at Keystone. We had two Good Friday services and four Easter services, and I want to say thank you and celebrate. There was 388 volunteers that showed up all weekend long to make that happen. And yeah, that's incredible. And so if you served with us uh, over the Easter weekend at all, Thank you so much. I know that that's a huge commitment on your part, and it's making a difference helping people know and follow Jesus, which is what we're all about. And here's the fruit of that labor. Guys, there was over 3,000 people that walked in our doors over Easter weekend. Yeah, isn't that great? Give God glory for that. That 3,000 people, like here's what that represents, right? Because, I mean, it's great to have people in the seats, but practically here's what that represents, and here's why it's exciting. It means that there are literally hundreds of people walking into this place for the very first time, going, hey, what does it mean to be connected in the life of the church? What does it mean to know and to follow Jesus? And man, asking those questions and taking those steps. And so if that was you, um, maybe you were brand new this last weekend, come say hi, I'd love to meet you. Um, man, and if that was you that served, thank you again. It makes a huge difference. The second thing I want to celebrate with you is going on actually right now. So you've probably heard a lot, if you've been around, that we're a next generation church. But if you look around, there's not a lot of middle school and high school students here today. And here's why, because this weekend was Reset Weekend. And so Reset Weekend is an in-town retreat designed to build community and deepen gospel roots. And so here's what happened. We had 140 middle school and high school students and leaders that committed their Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to an in-town retreat, worshiping Jesus. We were here this on Friday night, worshiping. Saturday, they went out and we said, hey, what does it look like to take our faith into the community? And so Saturday, we served, had 100 and, 140 people served at 13 different nonprofit partner organizations around the city of Des Moines, going, this is what it looks like to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And then tomorrow, or tomorrow, 1045 service, they're all gonna crash into this place. And so if you're like, where are they all at? Come back to 1045, I'll show you. Um, they're all gonna come into this place and worship together one last time before they head out and they go, hey, what does it look like now to take our faith back into our school? And so man, if, you've, um, if you know any of those students, ask them about their weekend, ask them what Jesus did. Here's what I know for sure. I know at least one student this weekend gave her life to Jesus for the very first time. Yeah. And so, man, uh, what God's doing in the next generation is absolutely incredible. Um, and, man, if you are a middle school or high school student you haven't gotten connected or you have some students, we'd love to help them get connected. Well, in just a second, I'm going to have Pastor Brent go ahead and come on up. In just a second, we're going to kick off a brand new series um, called Not Your Own. And so, Brent, I'd love to just pray for you before we kick this off. I'm super excited to see how the, what the fruit that this brings. So, yeah. um, Jesus, thank you so much for what you did in this place over Easter weekend. God, thank you for the hundreds of people who walked in going, what does it mean to experience resurrection power? 
Um, God, I just thank you for the students that are investing their weekend right now. And then I pray for each of us. God, would you, um, would, would you draw our hearts to yourself? God, would you use Brent and the word that you've prepared, God, to speak into our lives? And God, would it change the way we live? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Keystone. Man, I am excited to jump into this new series with you. Um, if you're coming back after Easter, we're so thankful that you're back with us. Um, we, if you've been with us with the church, you have experienced this, and let me catch you up for some of you kind of coming in for uh, new, newly. In 2023, we said that our, this was a year to flourish in the kingdom of God, and we really began to press into what is it like to live in the kingdom of God versus walking on planet Earth, um, and how do we put our mind's attention and our actions behind what he wants for our life. And so last year, last summer, uh, we pushed into the parables, which explains how the kingdom of God works. Then we went through the Sermon on the Mount, which is often some people would say it's the kingdom manifesto. If you wanna know all about the kingdom of God, then go in and check out uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And so as we've pressed into these things, here's what's interesting thing about the teachings of the kingdom a lot, is oftentimes it has a lot to do with our hearts and our minds. It has to do with things like in the sermon, do not judge, do not worry. Um, it has things, do not hate, do not look lustfully at things. And it really pressures our heart and our mind, which is really good because it's, our hearts are a harder uh, thing to wrap our minds around than sometimes our body. But so as we continue to press into this, here's what we've discovered, is that often when we think about the kingdom of God, we think about our heart and our mind, but did you know that what God's kingdom and the way he teaches has everything to do with where we work, live, and play as well? And so as we've kind of going to kind of wrap out this season, we're going to, the series that we're starting is called Not Your Own, and the subtitle really makes a lot of sense of what that means. Here's what it is. It's authority and responsibility in the kingdom of God. Because what King Jesus teaches, the way he instructs us, it doesn't affect our heart and mind only, it also affects where we live, work, and play. Let me explain what we're going to do. Over the next few weeks, uh, most of the time, if you've been around Keystone, we start in a book. In fact, in June, we're going to start a book for the whole summer excited about that, but we want to talk about how the kingdom interacts with a few places. And over the next few weeks until Memorial Day, here's some of the topics we're going to deal with. We're going to first start with the institutions of God, which are the family. And we're going to spend two weeks on husbands and wives, or one week on husband and wives, and one week on parents and children. How, how, who's in charge? Who has, what are our responsibilities in that? Then we're gonna talk about the government. We're gonna talk about the church. All of those are the institutions of God. But then we're gonna take the same questions of who's or who has authority and what is our responsibility into areas like when it comes to your work and how you do work, what does God's kingdom speak into that? Also, our physical bodies. How do we deal with that? And then finally, we're gonna end on how we witness and how we do outreach in God's kingdom. And so I am super excited for us to press into this. And today, I have the complete unenviable position of teaching on the government. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> um, so that's where we're going to start off today. And man, I, I am eager I've never been more convinced that we need to hear God's word. I'm also a, a bit timid because people have, I'm not timid in not what God stands for, but know that this is a sensitive subject. But God's word is completely clear. But let me start this way. I love this country. Um, I am overly fascinated with history. I have stood in places in Washington, D.C., historically, like, touring that place with tears running down my eyes. One time I tried to convince Carrie that I needed to join in the army. Um, I at random times just go read the constitution because I think it's fun. Like I, I genuinely love this country, studying, geeking out on the history, I absolutely love it. And so it's really interesting as we talk about government because we live in this wonderful country. And one of the reasons I love this country is over the time because of my love for missions and that's kind of one of the things that I do here, but just my life in general is this. I've visited over 15 countries uh, in my life. And when you visit 15 countries, um, I've been to the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poorest. And here's what you need to know. Nothing compares to the United States of America. 
It's unbelievable. One of the reasons is just the things that we have, the economics that we have, some of those things are beautiful, but also the rights that are given to us by our constitution. Like people, people around planet Earth would love to have the freedoms that we have. And here's what's interesting. As much as I love our country, if you know and follow Jesus, we must realize this. We love our country. But first and foremost, we are citizens of a different kingdom than Earth than the United States. We are citizens of heaven. This is Philippians 3.20. It says this, our citizenship is in heaven. Listen, our first and primary citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It, what's beautiful is we belong to something so much bigger, as great as our governor, government is, we belong to something so much greater. And this dual citizenship of being a citizen of heaven but also a citizen on earth can get complicated at times, very complicated. It is possible, and in fact, it's often true, that we know our constitutional rights more than we know the commands of God. It's also true that we trust our political process more than we trust King Jesus, who we just sang about, is worthy of worship from all people, all nations, all tribes. We can get those things confused. In God's word, man, there's so much that we could say. In fact, I don't think that I've ever in my life cut more from a sermon than I had to cut to get to 35 minutes for you today. Um, but we're gonna focus on a few passages that are so crystal clear. We're not gonna solve the political problems in America. Somebody say amen to that. Like, well, that ain't what we're doing today. But what we're gonna do is look at God's word because it's gonna give us some incredible instruction. Now, before we jump into these texts, you gotta understand some context. Uh, one of the first hermeneutical principles they teach in seminary, that means interpretive uh, measures, is that you need to understand that when God's word speaking, it has one truth. It does not have 10 truths to 10 different people, however they wanna do it. It's one truth. You should say amen to that. But here's the issue, is that when God's word was written, it was written to a radically different context than we live today. The context we live today, we live in a democratic republic. Uh, we get to vote. We have incredible uh, freedoms. We have the freedom of religion. We have freedom of speech. There's a lot going on in our constitution that is really great. That's not the context that this was written. When this was written, it was written, we're gonna really focus on Romans 13 and uh, 1 Peter 2. It was written by two different people living in a radically different place. Both of these people were severely persecuted and imprisoned. It was written between, both of these books were written between 57 and 64 AD, and that's really important for us because it's in that moment that there's a guy named Nero who is on the, who's the emperor of Rome. If you guys have studied, by the way, you don't have to study the Bible, if you just study Roman history, Nero is known to be the most persecutor of all Christians. In fact, there was a fire in 64 AD in Rome, and he hated Christians so much that there's no evidence that Christians were responsible for the fire, but he blamed the fire. In fact, some people say he started the fire, and he blamed it on all the Christians so he could kill them all. We know for a fact that Peter himself was killed by Nero, and most likely Paul was. It's not documented how Paul died, but he died in the reign of Nero, and it's most likely he was martyred under Nero radically different context. There was no freedom of religion. You couldn't gather like this and feel like you're good. Like if you did the wrong thing, um, emperor of Rome was coming after you. So that's just really helpful to know when God's word is speaking on the government, what the context is. Let's begin in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 says this. Here's what we're gonna ask when we read in this. Who's in charge? Remember, authority and responsibility in the kingdom of God. Who's in charge? Romans 13, 1. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except for God and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. There is no authority except by God. Here's what Romans is clearly saying. God has the ultimate authority. Now, he grants authority, he gives authorities to rulers on earth, but ultimately, he is the one who has the authority because he can assign people different authority. And what's interesting is that these authorities exist because they are instituted by God. God is the one who thought up government. It is God's ideal, it is the one, who, he's the one who started it. God is ultimately in authority over all things government. 
And there's implications to this. But keep reading in verse 13, verse 2, Romans 13, 2. So then, the one who resists authority is opposing God's command. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. Here's the idea. God said, I'm so saying that I'm in authority that if you rebel against the authority I've put over you, you're actually rebel rebelling against me. If you resist government, you are opposing God. And then it even goes, says, if you resist, you're bringing judgment upon yourself. And all God's people said, Listen, it's a value in this church. We stand in awe of God's word. You cannot pick and choose the verses that you like, brother and sister. Now, wait a minute. What about evil leaders, Brent? Man, could we, this is where I've cut, 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 cut on this sermon. We're hopefully gonna do a podcast to kind of answer some of these questions. Listen, this is a rabbit hole we can't go under, but you need to know this God has instituted government. He allows evil leaders to sit in this institution. He allows it. I don't know why. It's beyond me and your pay grade. I can think of one biblical example, Cyrus the Great. He was, uh, this, he was the ruler who came in. He was a conqueror, conquered Babylon. When he conquered Babylon, it's not because he was worshiping God. He was an evil, power, hungry man who conquered Babylon. But when he did it, he, God used this evil man to send the people of God back to Jerusalem. God can use evil rulers. I don't know how he does it, but the fact is, is that God is in control. He also often will allow a leader, but he is ultimately in throw. But think of it, the king of Israel. He didn't want a king over Israel. The people wanted a king over Israel. And God allowed them to have what they wanted. Then what happened? Go read 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Trouble, <laughs> trouble, trouble, trouble. It's God who instituted. So what is the government in charge of? Verse three and four, they are God's servant. Let's read, I'm gonna read Romans 13, three and four, and I'm gonna read First Peter 2, 13 through 14. These are really cognate verses. They almost say the exact same thing through and through. For the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is servant, uh, God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. That's Paul in Romans. Paul's writing Romans and when he's in Corinth in about 57 AD. Peter, 64 AD, 62 to 64, is writing first Peter. He's actually in Rome. And here's what he says in verse two. It says, submit to every human authority. Does that sound familiar? We just read that in uh, Romans 13 of the Lord, whether to emperor as the supreme authority or to governors sent out to punish those who do what is evil and praise the ones who do what is good. Theologians would say, what is the role of government? It's number one is to act for your good. This is first, Romans 13 says, for it is God's servant for your good. First Peter says, it's praise, it praises those who do what is good. And so the idea is the government, one of the reasons God instituted is for our good. The fact that we have roads is a government project. The fact that those roads get plowed in the winter is a government project. That is for our good. If someone attacked our country, our government would defend us. Um, I think of another like really beneficial thing is land rights and real estate laws in America. It is really complicated to buy a house. But one of the reasons all those rules and regulations are there is that we can actually build wealth on our land where so many countries in the world, you could never do that. Like it's for our good. A lot of these regulations are for our good, but then uh, let's, let's talk about evil. It's also not only for our good, it's to punish evil. Romans 13 says, but if you do wrong, be afraid. You parents understand that with your kids, right? First Peter 2, 4 says, to punish those who do what is evil. And so the government is also there when there is evil to take care of it. If today you went and robbed a store and a police officer came behind you, you should be afraid. You should be scared because you did wrong and through criminal and civil laws, the government's gonna come after you. And if you robbed a store, you should go to jail because the government yields that power to punish what is evil. Here's the point. You're writing things, you should write this. God is in charge. 
God is in charge. He is the ultimate authority. He started it. He rules over it, and he designed it so that it would be for our good and to punish evil. The government has a role, but ultimately he is the boss. So this lends itself to asking us the question, what is our responsibility? What is your responsibility? What is my responsibility? If God is ultimately in authority and he gives that authority to the institution he created for our good and to to punish us for evil, what is our responsibility in the middle of it? This is where the rubber meets the road. It takes a lot of wisdom. We're gonna ask some questions on the back. I already know all the questions you're asking. I'll try to answer a few of them on the back end. There's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of opinions in this room. But let me say, here is what is not up for debate. God's word is really clear on this. If you're taking notes, write the first one. Submit, submit. I'm gonna read a lot of scripture because I think you think that that's my opinion and not God's opinion and I wanna prove it to you. Romans 13, one, let everyone submit to the governing authorities since there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Romans 13, five, therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. Not only because you're fearing the sword, that's what Romans language is, but also out of your conscience. 1 Peter 2, 13, submit to every authority because of the, because of the Lord. Not because of civil goodness, Because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. Titus chapter three, verse one. Remind them to submit to the rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. And all God's people said, (laughs) that's hard as an American, right? That's really hard. I don't know if you know, we started out as a country in rebellion. We're like, yeah, we're not submitting to those taxes, bro. (laughs) We're going to throw tea and get some wars going. And it's basically been like that a lot. Now, listen, we're going to talk about civil responsibility. That's a different, I'm just trying to tell you, we don't like the word submit. What does this mean? Like, we think of it often in terms of like a a chokehold, like you're submitting to someone. But here the scripture says, the idea of submitting is to put yourself under someone else. It's a willful choice to say, I'm not gonna try to be my own God, I'm gonna submit to someone above me. And this is why we start off with who's in charge. God is ultimately in charge, God. Now, there's governments and they have a role and they have authority, but ultimately we trust God. And what we're doing by submitting is we're actually submitting unto the Lord. It's a willful choice. And let me remind you, when all of these are written, when, Rome, when Paul's writing Romans and Titus and he also writes to Timothy and First Peter's writing First Peter, these are moments where the government wanted to kill them. This was not a moment where it was really easy to submit. This is a moment where it's really hard. Turns out that this is actually the way of Jesus. God says, he has all authority, but this is Philippians 2, chapter, verse, chapter 2, verse 5 and 8. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who in this, existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or held on to, is what that, harp, that word is harpagamos in the original language. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he became, and he had come a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus himself. Listen, you remember Isaiah, the prophecy of Jesus? It says, and the government would be on his shoulders. <laughs> like the government was gonna come after, the government is the one who came after Jesus, yet he put himself underneath it. We have to submit. Number two, we have to pray. We have to pray. First Timothy 2, 1 through 2 says this. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. You do not need a seminary degree to understand what that passage says. 
You do not need to walk with Jesus for 50 years to know how to do what this passage says. It says, pray for kings and all those who are in authority. When was the last time you prayed for the politician you think is the dumbest? Do you think, I'm reading really quickly, Paul writing to Philippians. By the way, he's in jail. You understand this, right? He's in jail in the Philippians. This is one of those prison epistles. He's sitting in chains and writing, you should pray for the authorities. Have you prayed for Joe Biden? Have you prayed for Kim Reynolds? Have you prayed for the House and the Senate who cannot seem to get along or pass any helpful legislation whatsoever? (laughs) Not their agenda, not the election. Have you prayed for those leaders? I think here's one of the principles. It's hard to hate someone you pray for. I know a lot of people who have a list that they pray specifically for enemies of theirs or people who have harmed them greatly simply to cultivate love and kindness towards them. Let's institute a new rule. You can have one political opinion for every 10 minutes in prayer. (laughs) Oh, wait. Sometimes our opinions are sinful. Next point is, We have to honor. Point number three, your responsibility is to honor. Guys, I am not making these up. I'm only reading the text. You ready? Titus 3, one through two. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for good work. Verse two is really important. To slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind always, showing gentleness to all people. Verse two starts out with not what not to do. It says there should be no slander. This word means to defame or damage another's reputation. There should be no slander. You should not damage someone's reputation. You should not speak inflammatory or make false statements against anyone. And then it goes, and we should also avoid fighting. Instead of picking a fight, that's not what we should do. And then it moves on to what we should do. What we should do is to be kind and always show gentleness to all people. What your mom taught you in kindergarten applies to you as adults when you have Facebook. This is God's word. This isn't your preacher's opinion. 1 Peter 2, 17, honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God, honor the emperor. Peter is talking about Nero. Peter's in Rome when he writes this. And he's talking about a guy who is known for persecuting Christians. He's commanded us to honor him. This very Nero is the one who who crucified Peter upside down, martyred him. He's saying you need to honor him. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. The Constitution grants you freedom of speech, but the Scripture does not. Scripture gives us the right to speak truth, okay? I'm not talking about that. We can speak truth, but not in every way that we want to speak it. It has to be honoring. It has to be kind. It has to be gentle. Number four, pay taxes. What's the odds that on... (laughs) April 7th, I'm preaching from the pulpit, pay taxes. It's, not, it's a coincidence, but I'm just trying to tell you it's in the Bible. Romans 13, verse 7, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those who you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect for those you owe respect and honor to those you honor. In the context of Romans, he's just got done saying that God, God's servant should do good for those who do good and should punish those for evil. It actually flows exactly from the Romans 13 argument is one of the reasons you should pay taxes is so the government can do good. If you don't pay your taxes, the government can't do its job. And I, listen, I'm going to write a check today. I literally, it's on my job, my task list today that is stupid. I hate paying taxes, but I read God's word and I don't have a choice, right? This is what God's word says. 
Later, also beyond that, Jesus himself talked about paying taxes. The Pharisees came to Jesus to try to trick him. They wanted to get him in trouble. They were always trying to do that if you read through the Gospels. And they, they kind of bring up this concept of taxes in a coin because they had a picture of Caesar on it. And the Jewish people hated that because there was an image, fourth command. There should be no image in front of you. It's a long story. But then Jesus says this, and he said to them, give then to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Jesus even says this. And we do all of this because it results in witness. Again, I could preach an entire sermon on this for us, and we're gonna close the series in this concept. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 again. First of all, then, I urge you that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and those who are in authority. Listen, this is real important. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. There's a direct correlation both here and I don't have time to read it, but it's almost the same argument, 1 Peter 2. It's also in Titus 3 and here's the idea. The way we live our lives pleases God and when we please God with quiet lives and all dignity, it actually gives witness to the rest of the world. And here he's saying, listen, and that's a good and it pleases God. And when we live that kind of way, it's actually a call for all to be saved. There's a witness to our life. The way we live actually gives witness and testimony to God. The idea is this, is how we live speak louder than what we say. This is honestly one of the biggest problems with Christianity in America. We say things that we do not live by. We espouse biblical realities and we don't live by them. Let's talk about some questions. By the way, no way we can answer every question. (laughs) Let's talk about a few. What about civil disobedience? Civil disobedience is when we say, hey, listen, the government actually has a law on the books or is enforcing something to me that is against scripture, what do I do? Well, there's actually examples of the Old Testament with Daniel. There's actually examples in the New Testament. This is, let's pick a New Testament example. This is Acts 5.29. Uh, The Sanhedrin came and told uh, Peter and the disciples, shut up. You can't do that anymore. You can't preach about Jesus. Listen to what Peter says. For Acts 5, 29, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. You look at Daniel and the king said, hey, eat all this food. He's like, nope, I'm just gonna eat what God tells me to eat, okay? The Daniel fast in, in the very beginning of Daniel. Here's what I would say, man. There are, there are examples like crazy of people who are civilly disobeying. The underground church in China is civilly disobeying. Um, there are missionaries around the world that are civilly disobeying. Here's what I'm trying to say though, is if you enact civil disobedience, you better make sure it's God's word and not your preference. There is a lot of even recent examples in our country where people are enacting civil disobedience, not because God's word is clear, but because they don't want to do what the government says. And there's freedom of religion in America and there's conscience and we could talk about that all day long. I'm just trying to tell you that the quickest way to civil disobedience is when the government, when you can't do what the Bible clearly says. If the, scripture, if the government tomorrow come, in America comes out and says you cannot go to church, you should civilly disobey. If the government says you cannot talk about your faith, you should civilly disobey. But the bar is way higher in the rest of the world than what we experience it in the United States. All you gotta do is go watch Christians. You're not not gonna believe this. The church is exploding in communist China. God is in ultimate authority, okay? So make sure that your bar is God's clear word and not your preference. Number two, what do you do when the government does evil and not good? That's a good question. Because the the scripture says that the government's job is to is for our good and to punish those who do evil. What happens when the government does evil and not good? The first question I would ask you in that case is, is does it allow evil or does it force you to be a part of evil? We live in a country where increasingly our government is allowing evil. 
And that should alarm you. That is an issue, a serious issue in our country. But most of the time, I, I've thought multi, I can think of maybe a couple examples where our government would force you to do evil and not just allow it inside of our civil society. And if there's a part where it's trying to force you to do evil, I think we're back to civil disobedience. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Number one, what do you do when the government does evil? What the scriptures tells us is number one, pray. And this is a throwaway term in Christianity because we say, I'll pray for you. That's our way to say goodbye. I'm tired of listening to your story. But pray. This is the stark reality that the rest of the world, this is the only thing the rest of the world happens. I have time? I'll make it time. Um, one time I was hanging out with a Vietnamese pastor who had been in prison most of his life. Not most of his life, a significant portion of his life. And uh, he was telling a story. They were meeting. The police are coming. And, uh, and he gets on a bike, and it's in the middle of the night, and he's riding in the jungle. And he's, he's just going as hard as he can to escape the police. And his front tire hits something. He flies off of the bike. He goes into a valley, and uh, he's laying down there. He's broken some bones. And he said this, and it was through an interpreter. And he said, um, in America, you have 911. He said, in Vietnam, we have Jeremiah 33.3. Is it called to me? What, what's the verse? Je Jeremiah, someone help me. Sorry, I didn't put it in my notes. Call to me, and I will answer you. Like, we have so many options. We can write a press release. We can write posts. We can do so much, and the rest of the world can literally just pray. That's all they have. There's no options for them but to pray that God would move. And you also need to engage. This is where we do have freedoms as America, and you do need to engage. Here's the last question is, how do you engage? <clears throat> there's two ditches. Number one is avoidance. We live in Iowa. There's a lot of political talk because of the, because of the early, uh, what, what's the word? Caucus. Yeah, caucuses. Sorry. Uh, because of the early caucuses, we get a lot of political text, commercials, YouTube video. I mean, it's just insane, right? And so a lot of people because it's such a hot mess, just wanna avoid it. I think that's a ditch and I think it's a mistake. Ignorance, you're annoyed, you're ign and you just don't wanna be a part of it. The other ditch that is not helpful is you're fixated on it. You have a deep passion, you have an overfixation. If it's political, you're dialed into it. Both of those are ditches, but what we should do is we should engage. Number one is we should pray for leaders, legitimately. And I, back to the question, when's the last time you prayed? any length for any, any leader in our country. The second was, you have a constitutional right and godly conviction to speak truth. We should speak truth. We should be really crystal clear on what God's word said, but we should also do it with kindness and gentleness, not with like complete vile and venom. Speak the truth. We should speak the truth to power. Yes, amen. Let's go. But how we do it is really important. And lastly, you have a constitutional right to vote. Use it. Use it. It's a beautiful thing about our country. You actually can vote and put people in charge. Let's talk about in this thing. Here's the point. If you just want to write this over the top of your notes, this is it. God is in charge. Engage in a godly way. God is in charge, engage in a godly way. Start with God is in charge. Most of us theologically believe this, but practically I'm not sure. We think, yeah, God's in charge, but we must win the election. We think God's in charge, but if blank wins, America is over. It's gonna go down the train. And let me just let you breathe in and out really quickly. The kingdom of God has not been shaken. It has been growing for 2,000 years. And the only places in the world where it's growing is where it is persecuted. It's not growing in America. And we have the most freedom of any constitution of any country. God is in charge. Take a deep breath. Number two engage in a godly way. Brother, sister, you should engage. 
You should submit to the government. You should pray for the government. You should honor those in charge. You should pay your taxes. And all of this, if we do it in a godly way, will result in witness. God is in charge. Engage in a godly way. Would you close your eyes with me? There's a, um, there's a hot topic. We're all over the place. There's some who are like, government, politics, stop. Some people are like, really excited. I think just this morning, the king that we just sang holy and worthy to is in charge, brother and sister in Christ. He's in charge. And also, brother and sister, we should engage, but we should do it in a godly way. A statement from something called the Baptist Faith and Message, which our elders affirm. And I think it actually puts it in an incredible way. And I just want to read this. I want your eyes closed and just listen with your, with your ears. All Christians are under obligation to seek to make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human society. Means and methods used for the improvement of society and the establishment of righteousness among men can be truly permanently helpful only when they are rooted in the regenerate generation of the individual by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism, every form of greed, selfishness, and vice in all forms of sexual immorality, including adultery, homosexuality, and pornography. We should work to provide for the orphaned, the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from the conception to the natural death. Every Christian should seek to bring industry, government, and society as a whole under the sway of the principles of righteousness, truth, and brotherly love. In order to promote these ends, Christians should be ready to work with all men of goodwill in any good cause, always being careful to act in the spirit of love without compromising their loyalty to Christ and his truth. God is in charge and we should engage in a godly way. Jesus, I pray that it would be true. I pray that our hearts would not fear no matter what the king may say or not say or the president or the governor or the legislation or the Supreme Court. God, we are convinced you are the king. You have saved our souls and you sovereignly rule over all people, over all nations. And God, would you let our souls rest with your complete omnipotence, omniscience, and care for us. And then God, would you help us in a way that we often mess up? Would you help us to engage in a godly way? Would you help us speak truth, vote, speak on behalf of where your scripture speaks, but to do it in a way that honors you and in your character, trusting in your ways and not our ways. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and worship?
Here's what I hope as you walk away from today, that you get buried deep inside your soul that God is in charge. And when you see a news report that rattles you, you say, I know that king. I know who's in charge of this. I can trust him. When it comes to the whoever wins the elections, you don't have to be in fear of who's in charge of the elections. God is. He raises a leader and he puts down another, the psalm says. The heart is in the hands of, or Jesus, the, the, the heart of the king is in the hands of God, the proverb says. God is in charge. And also, praise God, in America, we have the ability to engage in this process. But the scripture gives you clarity on how to do it in a godly way. Take every one of those rights. Speak truth in love and in gentleness. Vote. But also make sure you're submitting and paying your taxes. <laughs> um, God is in charge. Engage in a godly way. Before we leave today, uh, we have an incredible opportunity. Kyle, why don't you come on up? And the rest team come on up as well. Um, Man, God's been doing some really great things in the life of missions at Keystone. Uh, before July 1st, uh, we will send 45 different people overseas. That's adults, middle school, high school, and college. You should give God praise for that. Um, and so uh, today we have an opportunity uh, to send off a team who's heading over to Japan. So uh, this is Kyle Thomas. He's one of our elders, and he is leading this team. In fact, me and him went together uh, to Japan last year. So I'd love for you just to give a quick overview of what you guys are going to be about. I will try to make this quick uh, because there's a deep uh, heart of passion for missions, for the nations, the lost, um, and that should be on our church's heart as well. And that's why we're doing this. That's why we're commissioning and that's why we're going. Um, Keystone exists to help people know and follow Jesus. Part of that vision uh, for the last number of years um, and for the next is that we will be a gospel, uh, uh, overflowing fountain. Fountainhead of gospel, gospel expansion. expansion. And this is a, a vision of that um, coming to existence. And these are just normal folks who are saying yes to Jesus, taking their next step mm. with him. And so uh, very excited for this trip. We are visiting some partners of ours as Keystone Church that are church planters in Osaka, Japan. Mm. We're going to support them. We're going to encourage them. We're going to love on them. We're going to hear how the ministry is going. Um, and we're going to report back. Uh, we're also going to uh, experience some uh, missions work exposure English conversations, hopefully gospel conversations. Uh, Japan is the second largest unreached people group in the world. It's got 125 million people in a pretty small area, concentrated area, and about 1.5% is Christian. And of that, you know, <laughs> practicing Christians, yeah. probably less than a 1%. There's an incredible need in this place. And we serve a God and we get a partner with a God and we get to walk alongside a God who invites us into reaching the nations and the lost. So yeah. that's, that's what we're doing. And so uh, church, we want to make sure that you see these people and know what's going on at Keystone. So we want to pray for them in a second. Also, a little bit uh, selfishly as well. I'm headed out this week as well. I'll be spending the next uh, few, uh, next week and a little bit in the Muslim world and uh, trying to engage some partners for us to engage in that space as well. So I appreciate prayers for me as well as we go. So Keystone, uh, if you've been around, you know this, but for uh, this is new and it, it, it could be awkward. Let's not make it awkward. Here's the thing. We can't lay our hands and commission all these people, but all of you can reach out your hands like this. And we're just going to pray and ask God to be with them. So let's just pray for the team. Jesus, we come, and what we know is that you're king. And we do not understand, Lord, why there's a country called Japan um, that less than 1.5% know you. Uh, we don't understand that, Lord, and we, it bothers us that there are millions of people in Japan every, uh, that will die without you. God, it's not just another nation. It's not just another dot on a map. It's real people that will spend eternity away from you. 
So God, let that get in our souls and bother us. And let us do everything we can as a church to not only go there, but to all the other places we're going. So God, I pray a blessing over this team. I pray unity over the team. I pray boldness. God, I pray for spiritual work that they could never ask, think, or imagine. God, as they visit places and see the hold that both Shintoism and Buddhism have over the Japanese people. God, we pray that there would be people in Japan that would run from the Shinto shrines and that they would run into the arms of King Jesus We pray for our team that they would establish an incredible church that reaches uh, the next generation in that place. We pray for the campuses that are impacted by that. God, Kansai University, we pray that students would rise up there that would know you and follow you. God, we just pray for gospel effort. And God, we pray in this church that you would continue to raise up people to be sent to the nations. That God, we would not be a place that enjoys our beautiful worship services are in this place and ignores the needs of the gospel needs around the world. Be with me, God, as I go to some uh, interesting places. Uh, Keep me safe. Keep these teams safe, God. May the airplanes work and the checked luggage work. Um, And God, would you do a work that we would report back that you started it, God. May this be the beginning of a long effort of seeing the Japanese people come to King Jesus. In your name I pray, Amen. 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 We love you, Keystone. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day. What's this?